Hello class, Mr. Fino here. This is Unit 6, Lesson 1 on the geography and the early settlement of China. Uh, this is a cool topographical map shown uh, showing China from up above, but I'll get into more detail on it later. So in this section, you will learn how geography affected early settlement in China. Uh, this is another, it's an elevation map showing uh, the red is higher up and the green is the lowest down. Uh, so you can see a lot of elevated land in China. So the first question we have here is how big is China? So present day China is the fourth largest country uh, behind Russia, Canada, and the United States at 3.7 million square miles. Uh, present day China has the largest population at 1.4 billion people. So here this picture shows kind of how China and the United States are very comparable in size. Um, and I guess technically the U.S. is a little bit bigger, probably because of Alaska. All right, so the next question we have here is what is outer China? Uh, so outer China is made up of the western and northern parts of present day China. So if we're looking here, right, all of this red stuff here is outer China, the northern part and the western part. Um, outer China is a land of extreme climate uh, and physical features where surviving is difficult. So very, very cold with snow and storms and deserts with sand and sandstorms and just a difficult place uh, to live in outer China. Uh, what is inner China? So inner China is a land of rolling hills, river valleys and plains. It's a place good for farming. Uh, rivers flow from the west, um, rivers flow from the west. You can see here rivers flowing in from this direction uh, and provide water for irrigation. Oops, sorry. Uh, Inner China has two main regions, the North China Plain, which is here, and the, Chang the Changjiang basins, which are down here. And these regions are different. They have different uh, climates, um, they're best suited for different types of crops, but uh, rolling hills, um, uh, you know, grass, you know, good for grazing, um, uh, river valleys. But generally speaking, inner, inner China is good for farming. Uh, next, we have the Tibet Qinghai Plateau, also known as the Roof of the World. The plateau stands at an average of 13,500 feet above sea level. Uh, the plateau is massive, stretching a quarter of China's length, which you can see here, how, you know, long it is, right? It's stretching pretty far across. And it is a rocky land surrounded by towering mountains, which include the Himalayas to the south. Here below is the Himalayas, and there's, there's mountains to the north as well. But it's just surrounded by mountains, which you can see in this image here. Really, it shows nicely, you know, here's the plateau in the foreground. In the background, you can see higher up are... Um, towering mountains. Uh, the Tibet Qinghai Plateau, uh, the air is thin, dry, and cold with snow year round. Uh, the Huanghe and Changjiang rivers begin in this area in the Tibet Qinghai Plateau. Um, the only natural vegetation you'll find here are scrubs and grasses, which scrubs kind of look like this scrub grass, which can technically be used for grazing with animals. Um, so but one animal that's common in the region are yaks, which is a type of ox uh, to be to be herded here. So um, scrub grass, this kind of shows what a dry, cold climate might look like. And then this is the Huanghe flowing from the plateau. Uh, what is an oasis? So oases is the plural, right, of oasis. Uh, oases are the only place to cultivate crops or raise animals in the desert. So you can see here a couple of examples of that some kind of pond or maybe mini lake you can see here uh, up, up above what it might look like when i think of an oasis i think of palm trees but um, it's gonna have to have green it's gonna have to have water to work uh, next we have the taklamakan desert which is considered one of the most dangerous deserts in the world uh, desert winds cause huge sand dunes uh, and create sandstorms that move quickly which i'll show you what that might look like in the next few slides. And Taklamakan literally means once you go in, you will not come out. So that just shows, you know, illustrates how dangerous it is. So here we see 
uh, in the distance of, of a of a desert, a massive sandstorm, which when, when you when you get caught in a sandstorm, you just really got to ride it out, cover yourself up with clothes, and just hope for the best that it doesn't last too long. Here's a massive sand dune, right, which would be dangerous if you're caught in this, right, so high up. And then here's a map showing where the Taklamakan Desert is here, um, far west of China. And then the Gobi Desert, which I'm going to talk about here next. So the Gobi Desert has few sand dunes and is mostly stony. Um, there are sand dunes, but they're not as prevalent in the Gobi versus the um, Taklamakan Desert. All right, next we have the Northeastern Plain. The Northeastern Plain may, is made up of low hills and plains is mostly prairie grass, which you can see here in the top part here, this yellow grass, uh, which provides food for horses, sheep, and other herd animals. So that's one thing that can be done in the north, northeastern plains herding. Uh, the Liao and Sungari rivers run through the plain. I believe this, the Liao River is, is quite shallow, which is shown here in this picture, um, the Liao River. So it's only going to be able to hold small boats. First, the Sungari is bigger and can hold bigger boats. Uh, the plain is generally too cold and dry to grow crops. And in the south, a narrow coastal plain links the area to the rest of China. I'll talk about this more later. Um, and invaders would have used this gap to get into inner China. So there's the northeastern plain right in the northeast, um, right above the um, North China Plain, which we're going to talk about next. Uh, so the North China Plain is an area of flat grassland within inner China. Uh, temperatures ranging from very warm in the summer to quite cold in the winter, but it's a little more moderate than these other areas we talked about. And the ground of the North China Plain is covered in yellow limestone silt, which comes from the Gobi Desert. So um, here is, I believe this is the Huanghe, probably the water, and you can see the color is, gets from the, it gets its color from the silt, which we'll talk about next. And then here's a picture of some of the North China Plain and the location, which is south of that northeastern plain we talked about before. So the Huanghe is within the North China Plain, and uh, it gets its name Yellow River from, from the silt within the river. Uh, it is one of the muddiest rivers in the world and flows from the western mountaintops. Um, the Huanghe provides farmers with lus and good soil for crops, um, which is a good thing, but the Huanghe can also be dangerous with it's frequent flooding, which is also where it gets another name from. It's other, another nickname, which is uh, China's sorrow because of all the destruction it can cause. Uh, next, we have the Changjiang Basins, which are low coastal plains along the Changjiang River. Right, It's sort of southwest of the um, uh, North China Basin, or sorry, the North China uh, Plains. Uh, the Changjiang is the longest in, Ch in China, the river, with hundreds of tributaries, which you can see here. You can see river and all these kind of branching out uh, parts are tributaries, right? They branch out from the main river. Uh, people use it to transport goods from east to west. Um, and like the Huanghe, it flows from the western mountains and makes the soil fertile in its valley along its uh, path, but also in its eventual delta. Um, and the climate in the Changjiang basins is warm and wet uh, with the basins ideal for growing rice, which you see here and here as well. Uh, what did early settlement in ancient China look like? So archeologists believe there were cave dwellers in Northeastern China about 500,000 years ago, All right? They lived in caves and they're known as Peking man or Beijing man. That's what they're referred to as. And they most likely survive with hunting and gathering and also fishing for more food. Over time, farming and villages developed in the South China Plain, um, which so the population would have grown as these villages, these more permanent villages would have developed. Um, and uh, other areas of the uh, of China were too cold, dry, or wet for farming. So most of these early settlements would have been in the South China Plain. Here is a skull of Beijing man, some hunter gatherers, and then fishers fishermen. Uh, so this, I want to talk about this, the next few slides here, because um, they're quite important. Okay. So the question here is how is ancient, ancient inner China geographically isolated? Remember inner China consists of the, um, 
the North China, or sorry, the the North China, uh, the North China Plain, sorry, and the Changjiang Basins. All right, so this map tells us really everything we need to know about why uh, Inner China is isolated. So, towering mountains, rocky plateaus, and a cold climate formed a natural barrier in the southwest. So you can see here these mountains, right? The massive mountains here, um, the plateau. All this is largely inhospitable. Inhospitable. I mean, they, no one could live there, right? So there's a barrier here, right, to this area right here, which would be the um, a lot of the, the uh, Changjiang basins. Deserts also created a, another barrier in the northwest. So you can see all this is desert, right? This flat brown, right? And so where you see the green, right? All of this is the North China Plain, right? There's a little bit here, um, down here. But you can see how it's blocked, right? Um, by the rest, it's, it's blocked by all these geographical features from the rest of Asia, right? The only entrance was a coastal plain from the Northeastern Plain. The Northeastern Plain's up here, Right, so the only way in to the North China uh, Plain is this way, right? That's really the only way to get in because other, everything else is blocked off by some form of um, physical features. Uh, so why was it difficult to govern ancient Chinese civilizations as they started to, to rise up, as more people, more villages popped up, which turned into cities, which turned into civilizations? So the same reason that isolation was possible here made it uh, made made it difficult to uh, govern, right, a big empire, right? So the harsh geography and huge distances over China, it's a huge piece of land, made communication and transportation difficult, uh, and it also interfered with the movement of the military. So, right, to communicate from here to the other side of China would be very difficult to transport goods for the military to move throughout here. So that would have made it difficult to kind of uh, govern and lead an empire in this in this land. Uh, our next question is, how do people live in outer China? Outer China was not suitable for farming, so they had to find other ways to survive. Um, not many people lived here, but there were herders who could raise livestock, especially yaks, which you see here, it's a type of ox, in the Tibetan plateau. Um, so from the yaks, they could get meat, uh, meat to eat, butter, milk, yogurt. Um, and they could also use the yak wool for their clothing and to make tents like you see here. Um, the only communities in the deserts were at the oases, the o uh, which is again plural for oasis. And the northeastern plain was also good for raising livestock like sheep, goats, cattle, and horses. Um, and the people of this region would invade the North China Plain for supplies like I showed you here. The people that lived here, they would need to raid the people in, in this area because they had more supplies. And lastly, we have how do people live in inner China? So this is kind of the ideal place to live for in, in ancient China and China today, probably. Um, farmers grew wheat and millet in the North China Plain. This is a picture of what a millet looks like. Uh, they raised animals like cattle, sheep, oxen, pigs, and chickens. They also would have herded cattle, water buffalo, and horses. Um, settlers built permanent homes with packed earth. This is a very fancy version, but that might be something that Right, you can see it's it's just earth really packed in tight to make the walls. And then the Changjiang basins were good for growing rice specifically, but they could also raise pigs, poultry, and use the nearby seas for seafood within the Changjiang basins. All right, so in this section, we learned how geography affected early settlement in China. All right, 